It's nice to think she won't be around for a while. My youngest brother was getting married, and I was busy getting ready for an overnight stay. I even took paid time off from work to leave our home, where I live with my in-laws. It's been a while since I did that. I was packing my overnight bag for the celebration when I heard my mother-in-law's voice behind me. Never come back, and while you're at it, why don't you just get a divorce and leave, she said. Sure, as you wish, I responded calmly and accepted her spite with a quiet smile. Leaving her sneering taunts behind, I stepped out of the house. Before I got too far, I said goodbye to our home. Thank you for everything, it's been a long time. I don't remember ever being looked after by my mother-in-law, but somehow, I felt very lighthearted. I pulled along a slightly oversized suitcase, rushing to where my beloved family awaited. I'll be staying at the hotel for three nights and four days. What comes after that remains a secret? My mother-in-law doesn't know that I will never return as a resident of this house. I'm Michelle Williams, a 53-year-old part-timer. While working at an office, I also manage our busy household. My husband Daniel and I are the same age, and our marriage has lasted over 31 years. It was an arranged meeting recommended by an acquaintance, but we're a couple who share similar values and get along well. The only loneliness comes from Daniel's job as a sailor. He works for a shipping company and can be away from home for over a year at times. Still, our relationship is good, and we are blessed with a son. We live in a house with my in-laws until recently. I was mainly responsible for taking care of my husband's grandmother, who lived with us. I used my income to hire a caregiver during the day. After that, I took care of her mostly by myself. This went on until my grandmother-in-law passed away. Michelle, thank you for everything over the years. Grandma must have been happy too. She was grateful to you until the end, Daniel said, his kind words bringing tears to my eyes. Surrounded by children to great-grandchildren, my grandmother-in-law was well cared for. In her younger days, when I was new to household tasks, she taught me how to live properly. She was kind and fun, though strict at times, and seemed to laugh most of the time. Thanks to her, I could keep my job for my younger days, and work part-time even during caregiving. Despite caregiving being a significant burden, now that it's over, I find myself cherishing those days with nostalgia. I never imagined that the environment around me would change so drastically right after that. Daniel, due to his job on the ship, often has to be away from home for long periods. I'm proud of him for his important work in American logistics but living with my in-laws puts me at a disadvantage. The moment my grandmother-in-law passed away, my mother-in-law's attitude changed dramatically. Previously, she would try to appease me with sweet talk while dumping all the caregiving responsibilities on me. But as soon as the caregiving ended, she began to disregard me. When she went out, she would deliberately exclude me from the souvenirs, and when we passed each other in the house, she would bump into me on purpose. Her overly hostile behavior was so shocking that I couldn't help but be surprised before feeling disgusted. Moreover, my son Adam, who happened to be visiting, said something to me. Hey, Grandma started saying nasty things again. It's an old story, but when Adam was just five or six years old, there was a significant incident with my mother-in-law. She filled Adam with baseless accusations against me and upset. Adam reported this to the whole family. Your mom is cheating. She's going to leave you eventually. That woman is no good. She doesn't work and she's all bad. Your dad hates her too. That's why he doesn't come home. You got that? I was shocked to learn she had been teaching him such lies. I wasn't cheating and despite working every day and doing household chores, I was truly busy. Moreover, the reason Daniel was absent was genuinely because of work. That's such a joke. It's ridiculous to take it seriously anyway. Such a small kid won't understand anything, my mother-in-law sulked, and my father-in-law was also furious about it. I was too busy comforting a sad Adam to worry about anything else. Later, when Daniel came home, 
I felt relieved as he changed his demeanor and scolded my mother-in-law. Now, let's return to the present. Daniel is currently away for work. Maybe because of that, my mother-in-law seems to be taking full advantage. You'd think she'd have more free time now that the caregiving is over, but instead, she keeps me very busy. She frequently hands me complicated recipes to cook and demands a thorough cleaning. Just the other day, she invited the neighborhood ladies over, and they watched a marathon of dramas. I thought they were just enjoying themselves, but I ended up having to clean up the messy room full of snack wrappers and drink spills right during the busiest time before dinner. It added unnecessary work, and I was understandably irritated. Really, you're such a drag. Aren't you done yet? Hurry up and get dinner ready? She'd say while I was sweating from cleaning up. But come dinner time, she wouldn't even sit at the table, claiming she was full from the snacks. I was utterly exasperated. Then Adam complained to me. She says she doesn't like you, and that you should disappear. I'm going back home. I feel sick. Wouldn't it be better if we lived separately from Grandma? I think Dad would understand too. I calmed down and upset Adam and drove him to the station for his return trip. Of course, I couldn't let things continue like this. Soon, I'll need to have a serious talk with Daniel. The day after Adam left, I was troubled, not by my mother-in-law, but by something else. Suddenly, I started feeling unwell. My limbs were cold, yet my face would suddenly heat up and I'd break out in a sweat. It seems like today my symptoms of menopause were particularly severe. I've been feeling oddly unwell since last year, and the doctors told me it's menopause. Right now, they're just watching how it goes, with no medication yet, but some days can be tough. Maybe the stress from what I heard about my mother-in-law's behavior is getting to me. By evening, my condition worsened, and I was lying down in my room. Hey, what are you sleeping for? Dinner. I could hear my mother-in-law stomping towards me. I had such a headache that it was hard to even get up, let alone deal with her. I thought about pretending to be asleep, but she suddenly yanked off the blanket, and I reluctantly sat up. Dinner. She clapped her hands as she demanded dinner. If she wants dinner, she should make it herself. Why does she always expect me to do it as if she's someone special? My grandmother-in-law used to manage the kitchen but lately it's only been me cooking. My mother-in-law only steps into the kitchen when Daniel is home. And even then, she barely does more than arrange the plates. Maybe she can't cook at all. I'm feeling unwell. I think it's menopause, but I really can't do the housework today. Please, can you make dinner today? I managed to say, feeling utterly tired. My mother-in-law had severe menopause symptoms herself. I had already moved in with them and had my fair share of her snapping at me, so there's no doubt about it. I thought she'd understand the pain if I mentioned it was menopause. However, her reaction was the exact opposite of what I had hoped for. With a snort, she suddenly turned a bag over my head. What? I let out a small scream as something showered down on me in the dim room. Just waking from sleep and feeling sick, I couldn't tell what it was at first. A moment later, I realized it was the smell of potatoes. The bag she turned upside down was nearly empty, but she had sprinkled me with snack crumbs. The sheer unexpectedness of it left me dumbfounded for a moment. Don't be lazy, she said with a click of her tongue, and then left the room. Here I was, bedridden and in pain, being yelled at. I almost felt like clicking my tongue back at her. How could she do something like this? Rather than anger, it was a bizarre sensation, like seeing some rare animal. I felt sure that my limit was nearing. About half a year later, I had taken some paid leave from work and was preparing for a trip. It was for my younger brother's wedding. He had been living with his girlfriend for a few years, and they were finally tying the knot. Their home is in Michigan, and they wanted to have the wedding there. Since it's quite far from here, I booked a hotel for a three-night, four-day stay. I decided to take the trip and participate overnight. My younger brother offered to cover the hotel costs, but I declined. Since the date of the ceremony was set according to my schedule, 
I wanted to pay for it myself. It's a small ceremony with just the family, but it's a rare opportunity for all the relatives to gather, so I'm looking forward to it. Since nobody else would likely prepare meals in my absence, I decided to make a week's worth of meals in advance the night before leaving, while we were eating dinner. I told my in-laws about the meals I prepared and stored in the fridge. My father-in-law thanked me, but as usual, my mother-in-law seemed displeased with everything about me. Why are you even going to your brother's wedding? It's just a remarriage, isn't it? Probably nothing good, she said with a frown, and my father-in-law glared at her. Actually, both my brother and his partner are marrying for the first time, I replied. My mother-in-law burst out laughing with a rude expression. First marriage at 41? There must be something seriously wrong with him to be single that long. Your brother's at a good age, yet he's having a flashy wedding. Shameless. She seemed to be confusing him with another brother, or had completely forgotten about my family's structure. In fact, I have three brothers. The youngest brother and I have a 15-year age gap, so he's still quite young. No, it's my youngest brother who's getting married. He's in his early 33s, and his partner is in her 24s, I explained, shrugging. My mother-in-law raised her eyebrows, offended by the correction, but soon twisted her face into a sneer again. How creepy. His partner is 24. That's like a parent and child, she said. I was astonished at her refusal to listen. This time even my father-in-law seemed to realize the mistake, clearing his throat. I swallowed a sigh as I responded, It's not 24, she's in her 24s. They are only five or six years apart. Doesn't that sound normal to you? I talked to her over video call the other day, and she seemed like a very sensible young lady. I ended the conversation with my in-laws and started preparing to leave. At the venue, I should see Adam and my parents as well. I packed a beautiful outfit for the ceremony into my suitcase and meticulously checked for anything I might have forgotten. From the living room, I could hear my mother-in-law loudly talking to my father-in-law. It will be refreshing to have her gone for a while. I felt the malice in her words on my back as I bit my lip. Getting angry now could provoke her to tamper with my carefully packed belongings better to endure until I leave the house the next morning. I pulled my slightly large suitcase and headed to the front door. Never come back, and while you're at it, why don't you just get a divorce and leave? Her words momentarily stopped me. As I began walking towards the entrance again, I answered cheerfully, yes, as you wish. My voice was calmer than I expected. Maybe I'm more relieved by this situation than I realized. I had reached my limit of endurance long ago. Actually, I had been in touch with Daniel beforehand, steadily preparing for this day. Just stop with the nonsense and really do it soon, my mother-in-law scoffed, munching on snacks and laughing early in the morning. It's surprising how much she can eat, just after waking up. I decided to walk to the station. As I left the house, before getting too far, I looked back at our familiar home and said with emotion, I really owe this house a lot. Except for my mother-in-law, I've been grateful to this home for a long time to my grandmother-in-law, my father-in-law, Daniel, and Adam. I even feel indebted to the roof and the walls. But I can't recall ever needing my mother-in-law's help. Somehow, I feel incredibly lighthearted. I hurried to the place where my beloved family was waiting, pulling a slightly large suitcase behind me. I plan to stay at the hotel for three nights and four days. After that, I'm set to move into a new place where I can live alone. I met up with Daniel at my brother's wedding venue. We had planned this beforehand. The reason the wedding was scheduled at this time was so Daniel could be sure to attend. Hard day, huh? Got this for you, Daniel said with a lonely smile, pulling out divorce papers his name hadn't been filled in yet. We were both going to sign it, mutually agreeing it would be our final joint task as a couple. Thanks. Let's write it when we get back to the hotel. I booked a twin room. Hope that's okay. Though it's sad for my brother getting married today, this is also a new beginning for us. 
I hope it's okay that our signing the divorce papers happens on the same day as the wedding. I won't announce it in front of everyone today, but we'll have to make it known later that we've divorced. Of course, a double would have been fine too. Thanks for booking, Daniel and I smiled affectionately at each other. No one could possibly imagine that in a few hours, we'd be signing divorce papers. I marvel at how heavy a single piece of paper can feel. Filing this means we won't be husband and wife anymore after being together for over 31 years. Just one sheet is all it takes. I'm truly sorry. Daniel apologized, but I shook my head. Being with Daniel was always genuinely happy for me. I knew when I married him that he wouldn't be home much, and there was nothing I disliked about that. It was just his mother that I could never get along with. Don't apologize. You were a wonderful husband. Let's be good friends from now on, I said with all the fondness I felt. Tearfully, Daniel took my hand. Thank you for everything, Daniel repeated, making me tear up as well. I secretly decided to attribute these tears to happiness for my brother's wedding. The next day, Daniel went back to his parents' home alone. He explained the situation to his in-laws. At first, my father-in-law was just shocked by the sudden mention of divorce, but when he understood the full story, he became furious. How dare you drive out someone who cared for my mother until the end? He shouted angrily, causing my mother-in-law to visibly panic. While I was primarily involved in caring for my grandmother-in-law, including the physically demanding tasks like bathing, my father-in-law, who had been strong since his youth, helped me towards the end. He also took care of turning our bedridden grandmother in bed. In a way, my father-in-law and I were caregiving partners. However, my mother-in-law really hadn't helped with anything. It seems my father-in-law had been silently resentful about this. You've been terrible at housework ever since you married into the family. I kept quiet because you gave birth to our son, but you used my mother's leniency as an excuse to avoid helping out. You're nothing like Michelle, who did everything, his grievances escalated. My mother-in-law tried to retort when compared to me, but my father-in-law started speaking before she could get a word in. It should have been you who left. To think we lost a hard-working daughter-in-law like that. Do you have any idea how much luxury Michelle's salary provided us? You haven't earned a single penny. Mentioning money put my mother-in-law in a weak position. She had never worked outside the home. The household expenses, including what my in-laws used, were covered by Daniel. Being a sailor, Daniel earned a good salary, and my in-laws converted all their pension into pocket money. Honestly, our family was wealthy. The costs related to the children or my grandmother-in-law's care could actually be covered by Daniel's earnings. Yet I worked because working was fulfilling for me. That's why I had no problem using my earnings for the family. I gave trips and theater tickets to my in-laws, and for birthdays, I treated them to upscale dining. Truthfully, these gifts were also investments in securing some time for myself. It's not too late, Daniel. Go apologize now and ask Michelle to marry you again, my father-in-law finally said. Realizing how precarious her position was, my mother-in-law was utterly distraught but it was too late. She couldn't prevent the consequences of her actions from coming back to haunt her. This is the house I built. You leave. My father-in-law, finally enraged, began to drive my mother-in-law out. Understandably, she resisted vehemently, screaming and scratching at her hair in frustration. As she raised her voice in anger, she began clawing at her hair, repeating how frustrated she was. This sight was bizarre and apparently quite frightening. No, I won't leave. I won't divorce. How am I supposed to live alone at this age? In the end, she cried out in resistance, but she was no match for my physically imposing father-in-law, who dragged her out of the house. He firmly shut the door and even locked it. My mother-in-law clung to the front door, crying loudly enough that the neighbors, shocked by the commotion, called the police. Reluctantly, my father-in-law opened the door when approached by the police, but his anger did not subside for several days afterward. 
My mother-in-law and father-in-law lived as if they were separated within the same house. They didn't speak a word to each other and avoided even looking at each other. Whenever my father-in-law entered the same room, my mother-in-law would flee in fear. Such a life couldn't continue. And ultimately, my father-in-law called his daughter, who lived far away, to hold a family meeting. I'm going to divorce her, he declared. But his daughter showed sympathy for my mother-in-law and opposed the idea, making the discussion difficult. Daniel then detailed the situation, confirming each instance of harassment I had endured. She had even lied to our son, trying to turn him against me. Daniel presented emails he had asked our son to write, recalling those times as evidence. He also spoke about the suffering I endured during my menopause. To this point, my father-in-law, who had witnessed it, expressed his disapproval. I hadn't known, but he had told my mother-in-law to stop such behavior. He had advised her to apologize, but she hadn't followed through. And now this incident. She had unfairly criticized my brother and mockingly told me to divorce and leave. All this happened while Daniel was away, and she acted differently in front of him. Daniel added that I had managed all the household chores and, along with the caregiver, had cared for my grandmother-in-law. In that situation, how would you feel if your husband's mother did the same to you? And if your father-in-law got angry on your behalf, whose side would you take? When Daniel posed this question, his sister fell silent. Seeing this, my mother-in-law became furiously upset. Are you betraying me too after all I did by giving birth to you? Hearing this, she didn't claim to have raised them. I ironically admired her honesty. I had always asked Daniel about this. It was mostly our grandmother who took care of my sister and me. Mom was always out with neighbors. Perhaps remembering her past, his sister looked at my mother-in-law with contempt after hearing about the bullying. In the end, the only working housewives in this house were my grandmother-in-law, whom I cared for until the end, and myself. My mother-in-law was indeed the mother who had given birth to three children, but when it came to housework, she mostly just wanted to reap the benefits without doing much work. By reflecting on this, her habitual negligence was finally noticed by the family, completely undermining her position. Realizing her situation, my mother-in-law stopped her tirades and began to sob. In the end, it was decided not to divorce out of pity, but my father-in-law is considering separating from her. Upon hearing this, I expressed my desire to meet with my father-in-law. All these events after my departure were relayed to me by Daniel. If Dad was going to get so angry now, he should have helped Michelle from the start. But then again, what can I say when I wasn't there? Daniel sighed despondently, sipping his hot coffee. We were in our favorite cafe, a place we had liked since our younger days. Daniel ordered a coffee, and I chose a soft drink, which I hadn't had in a very long time. As I finished hearing about my mother-in-law's disgraceful behavior, I smiled softly. Don't be too hard on yourself. You were away because of your job, right? It's an important job. There are many people who rely on you. I understand that. My words of encouragement weren't false. Daniel's job is admirable. Being a sailor supporting people's lives by working in maritime shipping, sometimes away for years at a time. I think that's incredible. That's why I've been putting up with it, but I'm sorry for this time. I still like and respect you, but I just couldn't bear being family with your parents anymore. I finally managed to say the words that had been stuck in my chest for so long. Daniel looked a bit sad, but nodded in understanding. He didn't blindly side with his parents, just because they were his family. He understood the situation fairly, which made me incredibly happy. I couldn't help but smile broadly, and Daniel looked at me as if dazzled. I only heard about what Daniel was feeling at that moment much later. He said he thought, Oh, she's beautiful. Your smile was more radiant than ever before. To me at that moment, Daniel also seemed sweeter than ever before. Now, back to the story. The day after I met Daniel at the cafe, I met with his father with Daniel's cooperation. It was time for the final act of my revenge. When Daniel's father arrived at the cafe, 
He was dressed a bit more stylishly than usual since he was going out. After some small talk about the weather, I quickly brought up the main topic. I heard from Daniel that you're considering separating from your wife. It's fine while you're still healthy, but it'll be tough on your own later, right? Especially after all the commotion. If you really do decide to separate, I'm willing to help with caring for you in your later years. His father clearly looked pleased by this. Daniel's sister lived far away, and his son Daniel could be away for long periods at sea. He had never been one to do much around the house like cooking, cleaning, or laundry. He would surely appreciate my help, having taken care of his mother until the end. Of course, I'll separate from her. No, wait, maybe it's better to divorce, he said, furrowing his brow and crossing his arms. I was hoping that my almost certainly ousted mother-in-law would go from almost to definitely ousted, but it seemed the situation was developing even more unfavorably for her. If I suddenly dropped dead, she'd probably make a big fuss, wouldn't she? Better to divorce her properly before that. That's definitely better, he continued. Daniel looked as if he wanted to say, here we go again, as his father began speaking more decisively. His father has a tendency to act swiftly once he's made up his mind. Sometimes he even goes a bit too far, but that's just his nature. Knowing this, I felt a sense of satisfaction as the situation unfolded. I nodded in agreement with a grin. You really do think things through. I'm impressed by your foresight, I said, knowing how to handle him after living with him for so many years. Pushing him a little like this would likely lead him to actually do it. Daniel chuckled, sensing my intentions but chose not to stop me. He was probably more angered by my mother-in-law's behavior than I was. His father, energized, stood up to go get the divorce papers right then. Out of kindness, I decided to introduce the lawyer Daniel and I consulted for our divorce to help my father-in-law. From that day on, my father-in-law began actively pursuing the divorce. It was clear that my mother-in-law was destined for a lonely life. Two weeks later, I returned to what was once my familiar home, now just my former in-law's house, to collect the belongings I hadn't been able to take with me before. I had taken all the valuables, but it was impossible to take everything, clothes, books, photos filled with memories, drawings by my son when he was little, and bedding and furniture I bought with my own salary. Over the years, I had accumulated many personal items in that house. This visit turned out to be the last time I would see my mother-in-law. By then, her divorce had been decided, and she was visibly panicking. As I went to collect my belongings, she began to kneel before me, her face pale, as she started apologizing. Michelle, please forgive me. I beg you, it was all just a joke. Please come back and convince your husband. I completely ignored her and continued packing. After continuing to grovel, my mother-in-law stood up abruptly. It seemed she was upset at being ignored. She began to hurl vile insults at me again, reverting to her old ways. This woman, how dare you when I'm being so humble? You've been nothing but trouble since you married into this family. Just leave and die alone miserably, she shouted, adding more simpler yet unrepeatable insults. I continued to ignore her and packed the items into a cardboard box. Suddenly, she screamed and lunged at the box. Taken aback, I dodged, and she ended up overturning the box that contained neatly folded clothes. The clothes were scattered all over the floor. She then began stomping on and kicking the clothes like throwing a tantrum. Enough already, Daniel shouted and glared at her, standing tall. His mother, usually hearing only compliance from her obedient son, froze as if it were the end of the world. I held back Daniel with one hand and turned an emotionless face towards my mother-in-law. I am no longer your daughter-in-law, you are no longer my mother-in-law. Our relationship is completely over. Thank you for nothing. I was helped by your mother and father-in-law and your husband. I swiftly stepped around the scattered clothes without bothering to fold them again. I just stuffed them into the box and lifted it up. Don't touch my things, stranger. Goodbye, 
I tossed those final words at the disheveled mother-in-law and quickly left the room. I had no desire to share space with that woman any longer. I called Daniel to take care of the rest of the belongings. I got into the car driven by my brother and waited as he prepared to leave. I could still hear my mother-in-law shrieking from inside the house, but listening to her was a waste of time. After we left, I heard she continued to beat her own head and wailed terribly. As far as I was concerned, there was never a chance for reconciliation, but it seemed she deeply regretted cutting off her last hope. But her regrets were too late to matter to anyone. About a month later, my mother-in-law was finally evicted from the house and began living alone in a modest place. Daniel occasionally visits his mother to check on her well-being, as does his sister. I've heard that my mother-in-law now lives in her old clothes, substituting them for pajamas, and doesn't even bother to take a shower regularly. Apart from shopping, she hardly goes outside, spending her days eating fast food and budget snacks while lamenting her impoverished life. Apparently, she did split some assets with my father-in-law during the divorce, but sadly, it wasn't a significant amount and she's living with financial insecurity in her old age. I don't know about my sister, but I'm not giving her any support. That's obvious, right? Daniel told me this with a shrug. As a well-paid sailor, Daniel was always a source of pride for his mother. She never expected to be completely cut off by her own son. All this was because she constantly disregarded me, the wife her son chose. And yet, the irony is that she herself had said, never come back and just get a divorce and leave. Now she's the one who can't ever come back. It's exactly like the saying, curses return upon the heads of those that curse. She should have been prepared to face her own misfortunes if she wished ill on others. Five years after the divorce, I'm enjoying a peaceful life alone with my cat in an apartment about a 25-minute drive from what used to be my in-law's home. I found this place after looking for somewhere convenient for commuting to work. The rental is pet-friendly and welcomes animals. It's a lovely place with good sunlight. I still visit my former father-in-law's home once a week to cook him various dishes. Our relationship has improved since the divorce. My sister-in-law, who lives far away, can hardly look me in the eye, given how much I still help out. Daniel and I still keep in touch. In fact, when he returns from his long sea voyages, we make sure to go on dates. It's almost like we're courting each other anew. We go to movies, visit museums, and despite being somewhat new at this, our relationship feels fresh and exciting. We spend hours on the phone and exchange messages, finding it surprisingly enjoyable. Adam, who visits us on his days off, jokes about our fake divorce, saying, you two just went back to being lovers, didn't you? But the truth is, Daniel and I never were lovers before. Our marriage was arranged, and we never really had a period of romance. So now, it's like I'm building a romantic relationship with him for the first time. We even have a secret pact. If we ever find ourselves completely free from having to deal with his mother, whether she passes away, moves in with his sister, or goes into a facility, then we'll remarry. Daniel suggests that this would be when no more welfare checks on his mother are necessary. Discussions about whether his sister and her husband will start living with her or place her in a facility have already begun. Our reunion might not be so far off after all. After more than 31 years together and now nearing our 55s, it feels somewhat embarrassing to talk about this but I'm thrilled at the prospect of experiencing true love with Daniel, whom I've always cared for deeply. Despite what you might think, I've already ended the lease for our apartment. Confused? Let me explain. My mom suggested we should cancel our rental agreement, so together, we went ahead and did that while you were away on your work trip. This is unbelievable. I can't continue living with such irrational people. My mother-in-law, Linda, thought that by ending our apartment lease, I have no choice but to move in with them. But I'm determined not to give in to this pressure. I simply refuse. What are you even saying? You're his wife, it's expected of you, someone insisted. 
But my response was clear, then I'll seek a divorce. My name is Mary, and I'm a 34-year-old who works in an office. My husband, Larry, and I tied the knot a year ago. We both work for companies that collaborate frequently, which is how we met. Working together led to us hanging out privately, eventually dating, and finally getting married a year later. Life with Larry was joyful. He's upbeat and humorous, and we shared many laughs living together. I truly believed I had married an amazing person and was overjoyed with our life together. However, I was soon to discover an unexpected side of Larry. Five months into our marriage, we spent our first New Year's Eve at my in-law's house. Before this, my interactions with Larry's parents had been minimal and brief. But that New Year's visit revealed their true colors. The gathering included my parents-in-law and my sisters-in-law, Nancy, who is single, and Emily, who is married with a young son, Justin. Emily's husband had gone to visit his own parents, leaving Emily and Justin with us. Until that point, I had a good impression of my in-laws, finding them as cheerful and approachable as Larry. I hoped for a pleasant and normal conversation during the visit. Unfortunately, things didn't go as expected. Mary, could you lend me a hand? My mother-in-law Linda asked, pulling me into the kitchen. As I followed, her friendly smile vanished, replaced by a cold look. You're quite slow. Normally, you should have offered to help without needing to be asked, she scolded. Feeling a rush of apology, I was worried I had somehow upset her. Eager to mend the situation, I did my best to contribute and hopefully win back Linda's approval. Yet, Linda's harsh criticisms didn't stop. She accused me of acting entitled because of Larry's kindness and questioned why I was still working instead of focusing solely on family life. Larry only agreed because you insisted, didn't he? You're not acting like a good wife at all, she scolded. She criticized me for not being more involved when visiting their house, claiming I ignored household duties and only added to Larry's burdens. Feeling hurt by Linda's relentless barbs, my spirits lifted slightly when Nancy, one of my sisters-in-law, entered the kitchen. We had shared pleasant chats before, so I hoped for her support. However, to my dismay, Nancy joined in the criticism, disparaging my cooking skills in front of everyone. This was completely unexpected, and I was stunned by her harsh words. It seemed both Linda and Nancy had chosen this moment to be particularly cruel, a side of them I hadn't seen before. The New Year celebration at my in-laws, which I had hoped would be enjoyable, turned into a deeply uncomfortable experience. Despite the ongoing feast, I couldn't find joy in any of it. Linda and Nancy kept the conversation among themselves, discussing topics only relevant to their family, leaving me feeling excluded. Larry, oblivious to my discomfort, didn't intervene. Linda's demeanor only worsened when she noticed my disinterest, commanding me to serve drinks as if I were a servant, with no one questioning her behavior. As the evening finally ended, Larry, having had too much to drink, announced his intention to stay over. Unwilling to endure any more, I managed to get him into the car and drove us home, leaving the unpleasantness behind. The next day, I reflected on the entire ordeal, pondering the unexpected turn of events and the cold treatment I received from those I had hoped to consider family. I decided to have a conversation with Larry about the discomforting experience I had at his family's house. Larry, Linda, and Nancy were really mean to me, I started. Larry seemed surprised and dismissive. That's hard to believe. We were all enjoying ourselves. You're probably the only one who feels that way. I tried to explain how Linda and Nancy had said some pretty hurtful things to me in the kitchen, but Larry doubted such an event, questioning whether I was making it up. When I pressed further, he excused himself, citing a hangover and a headache, asking to delay the discussion, which he never revisited. Later, Larry mentioned we were expected at his sister's house soon, for Justin's birthday. Without considering my feelings about our last visit, he insisted I attend and even pick out Justin's birthday gift, despite my busy schedule. After much thought and despite my reservations, I selected a gift I hoped Justin would enjoy. At Justin's birthday party, my effort seemed to pay off when Justin expressed genuine joy for the present I chose. Emily, assuming Larry was behind the thoughtful gift, thanked him. I waited for Larry to correct her, but instead, he took the credit, 
claiming extensive research went into selecting Justin's present, leaving me astonished and unacknowledged. I was thrilled to see Justin's happiness with the gift I had carefully chosen for him. Yet, my satisfaction turned to disbelief when Larry claimed the credit for the thoughtful present. Before I could process this, Linda's voice snapped me back to reality, urging me to hurry up with the cake. Confused? I asked. What cake? As I genuinely had no clue what she was referring to. Linda then shocked me by accusing me of forgetting the birthday cake she allegedly told me to prepare. I didn't hear anything about that, I protested, but my confusion only seemed to irritate her further. What kind of partner are you? Didn't you prepare the cake? She pressed, making it clear that she believed I had been informed. Admitting I had no knowledge of the cake only drew disappointed glances from everyone. Linda then labeled me as negligent, causing distress not just for me but for Justin, who burst into tears, upset over the absence of a birthday cake. Linda's consolation to Justin, blaming the oversight on me, only added to my dismay. How could you be so thoughtless? She scolded, as if the mistake was mine. Looking to Larry for support, I hoped he'd clarify the misunderstanding, knowing well that Linda had never asked me about the cake. To my astonishment, Larry sided with Linda, accusing me of being a poor wife and implying I had intentionally upset his family. Just when the situation couldn't seem more dire, Nancy stepped in with a cake she had supposedly bought, just in case. Justin's mood instantly changed for the better at the sight of it, and Linda lavished praise on Nancy for her foresight. Nancy then took a dig at me, suggesting she had anticipated my negligence. It was in this moment I realized the trap that had been set for me. Linda and Nancy had orchestrated this scenario to paint me in a negative light, cleverly manipulating the situation to their advantage. The situation took an unexpected turn when everyone blamed me for forgetting the birthday cake, branding me as a negligent wife. There wasn't a single ally in sight, even Larry joined in, accusing me of causing distress to Justin and declaring that I should leave as a form of punishment. You shouldn't expect to stay for the meal or enjoy the cake after causing such trouble, he said, supported by Linda, Anne, and Nancy's insistence that I go home. With no other option, I left Anne's house, embarking on the long journey back to our place alone, reflecting on the irony of having selected Justin's present during my work time. That evening, Larry chose to stay at his parents' house instead of returning home. When he finally did come back the next day, he confronted me with allegations of harassing Linda and Nancy and deliberately forgetting the birthday cake, as if I had some vendetta against his family. You're a terrible wife, he concluded, taking Linda's word over mine. I was stunned, not just by the accusations, but by his unwillingness to hear my side of the story. Wait, you're taking their word over mine? And you're accusing me of neglect when you claimed credit for the gift I chose for Justin? I challenged. Larry brushed it off, saying it didn't matter since the gift was from both of us. Missing the point entirely. It dawned on me that Larry was more interested in maintaining his image with his family than in standing by me. His actions and words stripped away any affection I had for him, leaving me to contemplate a future without this marriage. If this pattern continued, I realized, seeking a divorce might be the only way forward. As I mulled over the idea of leaving, an incident occurred that made up my mind for me. I had been away on a business trip for two days, unaware of any developments at home. Upon my return, I was met with the shocking sight of Larry's belongings neatly packed into cardboard boxes. Confused and alarmed, I reached out to Larry, who abruptly ended the call with a promise to return home soon. My frustration grew as I awaited his explanation, but to my surprise, Linda, Anne, and Nancy were with him when he arrived. Larry, what's happening? Why are your things packed, and why are they here? I demanded. Larry, with a smirk, announced, We're moving out. Moving? To where exactly? I asked. Bewildered. To my mother's, he stated plainly, as if it was the most natural decision. Stunned, I protested. Why are you deciding this without discussing it with me? Linda interjected, accusing me of being childish and insisting I should simply agree with Larry's decisions. However, I stood my ground, emphasizing that as a married couple, Larry and I should make such significant decisions together. 
To my utter disbelief, Larry revealed that he and his mother had already terminated our apartment lease while I was away. This revelation left me speechless. I couldn't believe Larry would make such a drastic move without my consent, effectively leaving me with no say in the matter. Faced with the reality of moving in with Larry's family, a prospect I was adamantly against, I reached my breaking point. You're suggesting that as his wife, I have no choice but to follow? I clarified. Exactly, Linda responded, convinced of her argument. In that moment, with clarity and conviction, I declared, then I'll divorce him. It was clear that staying in a relationship where my opinions were disregarded and where unilateral decisions were made without my input was not an option. The decision to leave was no longer just a consideration. It was a resolution. When I declared my intention to divorce, Larry was visibly shocked, unable to believe I was serious. You can't be serious about wanting a divorce, he stammered, but I firmly stated my resolve, tired of the endless drama with his family. Larry's face paled at my words, and the room fell silent until Emily and Nancy, unable to contain themselves any longer, objected vehemently to my decision. You can't divorce! Who will look after our father if you leave? Emily demanded, unwittingly revealing their true motives. It turned out their father had recently suffered a fall and required care, which they had hoped I would provide. Their reaction confirmed my suspicions that they had been plotting to burden me with the responsibility of caring for their father, a task none of them wished to undertake due to their self-centeredness. Their accusation of me being a useless wife only fueled my determination to leave. So, it's clear now. You were hoping I'd be the one to care for him, I pointed out, exposing their selfish intentions. Their defensive and aggressive responses did nothing but reinforce my decision. As the argument escalated, Emily and Nancy, in their frustration, suggested I might as well divorce and leave, thinking their words would hurt me. Instead, I took them up on their offer, starting to pack my belongings right then and there. This sudden turn of events caused Larry and Linda to panic, realizing the gravity of the situation and the inconvenience my departure would cause them. They scrambled to retract the harsh words with Larry pleading for me to reconsider the divorce and Linda suggesting a compromise where I could help by becoming a full-time caretaker for their father, even trying to sweeten the deal by painting it as an opportunity for me to become a stay-at-home mom. Facing this last-ditch attempt to manipulate me into staying, I stood firm. Unfortunately, I began, ready to make my final stand against their selfish demands, signaling the end of my patience and the start of a new chapter for me, free from their manipulations. Declining the role of a stay-at-home mom, I revealed to them something perhaps unknown. My salary exceeded Larry's due to my career progression at the company. I had been the main contributor to our apartment's rent, which wasn't cheap. This revelation highlighted the irony of their disdain for me, despite my financial contribution exceeding that of their own family member. With nothing more to add, I bid them farewell and left, leaving them in visible shock. I temporarily moved back to my parents' home and promptly sought legal counsel to initiate divorce proceedings against Larry. Larry, looking defeated, quietly consented to the divorce. In a twist of fate, Linda's attempt to delegate the care of their father to Emily and Nancy backfired as they outright refused the responsibility and chose to distance themselves instead. Moreover, Emily's personal life unraveled as she faced a substantial alimony demand following her spouse discovering her infidelity. Nancy accused Justin to living under her mother's roof and relying on Linda for morning wake-up calls struggled with independence. Her habitual tardiness, a result of her newfound freedom, ultimately cost her job. Larry, coerced back to the family home by Linda due to his status as the eldest son, found himself bearing the brunt of caring for their father. Overwhelmed by the dual responsibilities of work and caregiving, his exhaustion was palpable. Tensions between Larry and Linda escalated, leading to frequent arguments that disturbed the neighborhood peace to such an extent that police checks became a routine, isolating them further as the community distanced themselves from the family chaos. In contrast, I embraced a fresh start, securing a pleasant apartment close to my workplace. Enjoying my independence, I settled into a comfortable life, free from the turmoil that once clouded my days. 
The unfolding consequences for Larry and his family served as a stark reminder of the repercussions of their actions, affirming my decision to leave and rebuild my life on my own terms. I'm contemplating picking up a new hobby, especially since I'm not keen on diving into another relationship anytime soon. The whole experience with Larry and his family has been eye-opening. They had this tendency to dump all responsibilities on me, painting me as the villain in every scenario. Larry, despite earning less than me, had the audacity to be domineering, which was just pathetic. And then there were Anne and Linda, each wrapped up in their self-centered worlds, making it almost unbearable to be around them. However, seeing them entangle themselves in their own mess was somewhat satisfying. I'm rooting for Mary to discover a new passion or hobby that brings her joy and fulfillment. After everything she's been through, she deserves all the happiness and peace the world has to offer. Here's to Mary's fresh start and to her finding contentment and excitement in life's next chapter. Thanks to everyone who stuck around till the end. Don't forget to subscribe for more updates. Catch you in the next video! I don't need to be a daughter who is seen as a failure. My family left me behind the day I graduated from middle school. When I got home, the house was completely empty. After some time, I finally reached my mom on the phone. She, along with my dad and sister Evelyn, just laughed at how I reacted. It turns out they decided to move to Washington without me because Evelyn got accepted by a modeling agency. Evelyn is going to be the top model in the country, but what about me, Mary? What am I going to be? I have only one leg does that mean I'm worthless? I was in despair for a while, but being abandoned by my family gave me freedom. One day, I'll make them regret leaving me behind. My name is Mary Jackson, and I'm 27 years old now. I live with my grandparents on my dad's side. Here you go, Grandpa. I fixed the button on your shirt, I said. Thanks, Mary. You're really good at sewing. I can't even thread a needle anymore, Grandpa replied. It's okay. You can leave everything to me. I said, smiling. My grandparents always say how dependable I am, but fixing a shirt button is easy. I want them to rely on me for everything because they mean the world to me. They are the ones who saved me when my parents didn't care. My earliest memory is feeling strange about not having a leg. I lost my left leg below the knee when I was four. I barely remember it, but the pain and the injection still give me shivers. What hurt more than the physical pain was being left alone in the hospital. Mom didn't come today either. Will she come tomorrow? I would ask the nurse, and she would give me a weak smile. She'll surely come on Friday, the nurse would say, trying to comfort me. But Friday never came, and my mom never showed up. The kind nurse's comforting words just made me feel worse as a child. Most kids my age were always running around and full of energy, but I had to live a quieter life for a while. Still, by the time I started elementary school, I was walking normally again with a prosthetic leg. I sometimes had to sit out during gym class, but I could climb stairs and run a little. It didn't affect my daily life much. I wasn't treated differently at school, and I had friends. I loved being at school. I wished I could stay there forever, because it was my escape. I didn't feel like I belonged at home. I tried on my new dress and asked, How do I look? Cute. My sister Evelyn, who's three years older than me, twirled around in her frilly skirt. It spread out like a flower. Evelyn, you're so cute. Just like a model, my mom said, showering her with praise. My dad took pictures of her from all different angles. Evelyn lifted her chin like she was used to all the attention. Evelyn looks good in anything. I want to buy her lots of clothes. Maybe she'll be a model one day. Look how long her legs are. My mom said, putting her hands on her cheeks and swaying. My dad nodded eagerly. They were completely obsessed with Evelyn. At 15 years old, I was the only one who felt out of place at home. Yeah, I do have long legs, don't I? I think they're longer than my friends, Evelyn said proudly. Yes, yes, Evelyn's legs are the longest, my mom said. It's a shame how quickly you grow out of your cute clothes. Evelyn put her finger to her lips and smiled. Normally, Clothes that Evelyn outgrew would be passed down to me, but I wasn't treated the same. Mary isn't normal, though, my mom said, her voice changing. They were so excited about Evelyn, but then they'd look at me with pity. Was there some family rule to put me down at least once a day? By the time I turned 15, I accepted it. 
but when I was younger, it made me sad and angry. Evelyn always wore pretty skirts like a doll, while I was stuck in baggy pants. My gray or black sweatpants looked like pajamas no matter what. And, to make it worse, my tops were always t-shirts with hoodies. I want to wear a cute skirt, too. I told my mom one day. She looked at me, shocked. What? That's not going to happen. Your leg isn't normal. You can't show it off. Wouldn't you be embarrassed if people saw it? I'm not embarrassed. All my friends know about my leg. I replied. Well, it embarrasses me, so stop asking, she said coldly. If you can't wear skirts, at least let me wear cool jeans, I begged. Jeans? The fabric is too tough. It would be hard for you to wear. I buy you soft pants because I care about you. Can't you see that? And besides, jeans are expensive, she explained. But you buy so many clothes for Evelyn, I pointed out. I bought you a leg, didn't I? My mom said. I'm spending money on something no one else needs, and you still want more clothes for Evelyn? A leg for you, does that sound strange? Hey, does that sound strange? Under the pressure, I shook my head. My mom muttered more complaints. Your leg was expensive, you know. I'm paying for something you shouldn't even need, giving you a luxury, and yet you still want more. You're such a greedy child. Don't make things harder for your mother. The next day, Evelyn came home from the mall with our dad, carrying new clothes and showing off in front of the mirror. Meanwhile, I was stuck wearing the same plain sweatpants, whether I was sleeping or going out. I always wanted to dress up and that didn't change, even when I reached middle school. In fact, I was looking forward to wearing my school uniform, but instead, I ended up going to school in my regular sweatpants. It seemed my mom had spoken to the school, claiming she was worried about me. My kind... Mom managed to make me look like a helpless child. When uniforms were required, I had to wear boy pants. It was convenient that the boy next door, Kyle, had just graduated, so I got his hand-me-downs. Whether it was because the uniform was available or because my mom wanted to hide my leg, I couldn't figure out her reasons. By this point, I wasn't even sad anymore. I just thought, oh, so this is how it is, as if it didn't matter. Evelyn's dream of becoming a model grew stronger. She would post pictures online with captions like sweets and me or blue sky and me, then smirk at how many likes she got. She often made me take her photos, handing me her phone like I was her servant. I'd be in trouble if I refused, so I eventually stopped saying no. But Evelyn was very picky, making me retake the photos over and over, which was exhausting. Hmm, this one looks good. The angle from below makes my legs look super long. This is perfect, she'd say, then suddenly shout. Wait, hold on. No way, Mary. You're in the reflection of the window. Evelyn immediately deleted all the photos. That was close. It would be a disaster if people knew I had a sister like you. You showing up in my photo is so inconsiderate. You're not supposed to be seen by anyone. Think about your place, she scolded. After helping her with the photos, that's how she treated me. I didn't have the energy to argue back anymore. I just took in all her insults, knowing I wasn't needed in that house. I always felt like I was just in the way. I knew that all too well, so I tried to avoid causing any problems for my parents or Evelyn and lived like I was invisible. But never in my wildest dreams did I think they would abandon me right after I graduated from middle school. When I got home after the graduation ceremony, the house was a mess. Clothes and random things like a spatula were scattered on the floor, but the TV, refrigerator, and Evelyn's mirror were gone. It looked like no one had ever lived there. Mom, are you here? I called out. She had come to the graduation ceremony, but it felt like she was just going through the motions. I was the only one there whose parents didn't show any real interest. I thought maybe she had other things to do, but when I left the house that morning, she had just been lying in bed, so it was clear my graduation didn't matter to her. The strange state of the house sent a chill down my spine. I didn't care about the empty rooms. I only cared about whether my mom was okay. Could something have happened to her? A burglary, maybe? My mind jumped to the worst possibilities. Even though my mom didn't care much about me, I was worried about her. I searched the whole house bedroom, bathroom, balcony, but she wasn't there. I tried calling her phone, but it didn't connect. Then I called my dad, but all I got was his voicemail. 
I started panicking, calling my mom over and over again. Finally, the ringing stopped, and I heard my mom's voice, though she sounded irritated. I was so relieved, I almost cried. Mom, you finally answered. I'm so glad you're okay. Are you alright? Huh, she replied, confused. I quickly explained what I saw when I came home, and then, out of nowhere, she started laughing. What are you even talking about? There was no burglar, she said. How do you know that? I asked. Of course, we know because we moved out. What? I hadn't realized it until then, but the noise in the background sounded busy, like they were somewhere else. I could hear Evelyn and my dad laughing, too. Hey, Mom, what's Mary saying? Evelyn asked. She's panicking, thinking there was a break-in, Mom answered, still laughing. See? I told you we should have left a note. Poor Mary. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. My mom, Evelyn, and my dad were all cheerful, like it was just another day. Hey, Mary, we're moving to Washington. Do you know why? My mom asked. I didn't answer, because I had no idea. Guess what? I'm going to become a model, Evelyn announced. She had passed an audition for a modeling agency, and my family, excluding me, decided to move to Washington. Mary just graduated from middle school, so she'll be fine on her own, right? My mom continued. We could have moved earlier, but we waited until today for your sake. You get that we were being kind, don't you? They took care of me until I finished middle school, but now they were leaving me behind without a second thought. I wanted to go to school, but I had to figure out the money by myself. Finding a job at that moment seemed impossible. My mom taunted me with a cheerful voice. Well, try to figure it out on your own. I was frozen, still holding the phone to my ear, when she delivered the final blow. Evelyn is going to be the number one model in the USA, and Mary, what will you become? We don't need a failed daughter. Then she hung up. It felt horrible, impossible. I wanted to scream, help me, don't leave me. I thought about calling her back to beg, but I stopped myself. She wouldn't listen anyway. I was just 15, fresh out of middle school, and now I had to live on my own. Could my teachers help me if I asked? No, that would only bother them. Then I thought of my grandparents. They lived in the same city, but I hadn't seen them in 15 years. My mom always spoke badly about them, calling them terrible people who made her life hard. I wasn't sure if they would even take me in, but they were the only family I had left. Still wearing my middle school uniform, with a flower pin for my graduation, I took the bus to my grandparent house, barely remembering what they looked like. When I arrived, my grandma opened the door. Mary, is that you? You've grown so much. I've missed you, she said with tears in her eyes, hugging me tightly. I had prepared myself to meet mean people, but all the tension left my body, and I started crying. Emotions I didn't even realize I had came pouring out as I collapsed at the entrance. I told my grandparents everything, sobbing uncontrollably. My grandma's face was full of sadness, not knowing what to say, while my grandpa gently patted my shoulder. It's okay, you don't need to worry, he said softly. They weren't the bad people I had imagined. In that moment, I was saved by them, the only ones who cared. Mary, you're not a failure. You're just a normal girl. Don't be afraid, live the way you want to, they told me. Since that day, I've been living with my grandparents. They've never told me no whenever I ask them for advice. They always say, give it a try. For the first time, I wore a knee-length skirt that fluttered as I walked. Mary, you look lovely. It suits you, my grandma said with a smile. I felt a mix of shyness and joy. That was the first time I realized how much happiness wearing clothes I liked could bring me. My grandparents accepted me no matter what. When I dyed my hair blonde, my grandpa just smiled and said, it looks good on you. When I bought pants with holes in the knees, my grandma worried and added little patches to cover them. I secretly cried because I had saved up for my part-time job to buy a sewing machine. But on Christmas morning, I woke up to find a high-end sewing machine next to my pillow. I was so surprised that Santa Claus came for me at my age. These are some of my most precious memories. Living without restrictions, I went on to attend fashion school after graduating from high school. While I was still in school, I launched my own brand. I designed the cute skirts and cool denim pants I had always dreamed of. 
My designs focus not only on style, but also on inclusivity clothes that anyone can wear comfortably, regardless of age, health, or physical limitations. Now, at 27, my work is going well, and I feel like I'm living a fulfilling life. But everything suddenly changed when I heard a familiar voice. Mary, long time no see, my mother said, arms open as if waiting for a hug. She was standing in front of my company. I stepped back, but she quickly moved closer. My father was also there, scratching his head and smiling awkwardly. Wow, Mary, I didn't think you'd make it this far. This is your company, right? That's amazing. I always knew you'd become someone great. It had been 15 years since my family abandoned me. I wasn't expecting a heartwarming reunion. The reason they were here now was obvious. Recently, I was interviewed on TV about my company. The focus was on my products, but my parents were more interested in the fact that I was the CEO. Really amazing, Mary. I saw you on TV and immediately looked up everything about you. Your company's sales are $800 million. Does that mean you're a billionaire now? Wow, I'm so proud of you, my mother said excitedly, grabbing my hand. We've moved back from Washington. Let's live together again, she added, narrowing her eyes as if she were being kind. But despite the warmth she tried to show, I felt nothing but chills. I tilted my head slightly and said, Excuse me, but I don't have a mother. What? Mary, she asked, looking shocked. Trying not to sound too serious, I smiled and replied, Fifteen years ago, my family, my mother, father, and sister abandoned me. So, I don't have a mother. Over the years, when friends or others asked about my family, I always smiled and acted like everything was fine. If I told the truth that my family left me on the day of my middle school graduation, people would just feel sorry for me. So I never let anyone know the full story. I don't care about the past, I said calmly. Are you still angry, Mary? Holding a grudge over something that happened 15 years ago, my mother asked, trying to laugh it off. You're surprisingly vindictive. I kept my polite smile. It's been 15 years. I'm not angry anymore. I just don't care about people who don't matter to me. My mother's face twitched, and her eyes widened. It's funny how, when you become successful or get rich, suddenly more relatives appear. Like flies swarming around money, they need to be dealt with. Looking at the woman in front of me, I couldn't even be sure she was really my mother. After 15 years, she looked so different from the woman in my memories. Come on, Mary. We're family. We have a bond that can't be broken she said, rolling her eyes before grabbing my hand again. I can't say much about family because my memory of it has faded. But you're not my mother, I replied, still calm. Her grip on my hand tightened, but I didn't flinch. My mother isn't an old woman with wrinkles like you, I added, not breaking my expression. Her hand jerked away and she quickly covered her face. My sister had gone to Washington to become a model, and I remember my mother always taking care of her looks, obsessed with skincare. Even though 15 years had passed, a woman in her 60s shouldn't look like this. No offense, but aren't you in your 80s? I asked. She let out a small cry, her face twisting as more wrinkles deepened. The sight was like something out of a fairy tale, like a wicked old woman. Even though I was treating her like a stranger, Part of me knew she still had traces of the mother I once knew. But it was true she looked much older than she should. Her face was covered in wrinkles, and her cheeks sagged like a bulldog's. Her hair was streaked with gray, dry, and frizzy. She wasn't just thin. She looked starved. The fingers that had gripped my hand earlier felt like dried-up twigs. You ungrateful child, she snapped. After everything I did for you giving birth to you— raising you, and this is how you repay me? I am your mother. Shouldn't a daughter show some respect? She lunged at me, her desperation clear. It was obvious she was struggling in life. Respect. I asked quietly, watching her carefully. Her lips twisted into a smile. You're a CEO now, right? It's only natural for you to support your family, she said. Yes, I'll support my important family, I replied, easily shaking off her frail hand. But my family only includes my grandparents. What? She gasped. The rest of my family abandoned me, I said, walking away.
I have no obligation to help you, right? I said calmly. But you have money. Don't be mean. I'm not asking for your whole fortune. Just about $30,000, my mother pleaded, clinging to me desperately. Her tone softened as she tried to get through to me, her eyes filling with tears. Look, Mary, I'm in trouble. Life in Washington is tough with the high cost of living. I've had to borrow some money. Can't you help me? We're family, aren't we? She begged, tears streaming down her face. But the sight of an old woman pleading didn't touch my heart. I was getting tired of dealing with her when I saw three figures approaching behind her. My mother turned around, and her face twisted in annoyance. What do you want now? She spat, glaring at my grandparents. Is it wrong for a mother to visit her daughter? She asked, trying to defend herself. Yes, it is. My grandpa replied sharply, without hesitation. You've got some nerve showing up after abandoning your daughter. You said she was no longer needed, right? You threw her away like trash, and now you're begging that same trash for help. How pathetic. Mind your own business, my mother snapped. Grandpa smirked. The trash you threw away turned out to be a diamond, didn't it? How ironic. My mother bit her lip as Grandpa's words stung. She had always painted my grandparents as the villains, but after living with them for 15 years, I knew they were nothing like she had said. Even though Grandpa was angry now, he never spoke ill of my parents, even after they abandoned me. Trying to ease the tension, my grandma spoke gently. We've heard that you've been going to relatives, asking for money. Are you struggling financially? My mother's face flushed with embarrassment. She pressed her lips together and muttered, Yes, that's right. I have no money. Then, as if something snapped inside her, she shouted, I have no money. And it's all because of Evelyn. Hatred flashed across her face as she spoke about the daughter she once adored. We spoiled her. But for what? Nothing. All for nothing. She just spends money on clothes and makeup, never landing any modeling jobs. She's useless. My mother's frustration boiled over as she stomped her foot, her behavior shocking me. I could hardly believe what I was seeing. Suddenly, something large burst out from behind a tree, and for a second, I thought it was a wild animal. My heart nearly stopped, but then I realized it was Evelyn. Hold on, Mom. Evelyn yelled, storming over. I won't stand by and let you insult me like this. I'm cute. I'm more beautiful than anyone, Evelyn said, her voice full of the same confidence she had 15 years ago. But the truth was, she had no job, and all she did was spend money without contributing anything. That's because people don't appreciate my charm, she shot back, then added, and don't lie, Mom. I've done some modeling jobs before. Evelyn wasn't completely wrong. Even though I had moved on with my life, I couldn't help but check her social media from time to time. Her posts were full of glamorous photos, which only made me feel worse every time I looked. But I couldn't stop, even though it added to my misery. Then I noticed something strange her posts had almost no likes or comments. She only had five followers, which was fewer than my own old, forgotten account. The few comments she did have felt kind of mean, and when I checked out those accounts, it became clear they were making fun of her. No experience, but she acts like a pro. Spends hours demanding reshoots because the photos don't capture her charm. No wonder she doesn't get modeling jobs. Who would want to work with her? One comment read, What do they know? What's wrong with being picky when I'm a professional? Evelyn snapped, clearly frustrated. But the truth was, she wasn't getting any modeling jobs, and it was obvious why. I looked closely at her now. Her face was overly bright, her eyes seemed too large, her lips too pink, and her chin too pointed. The Evelyn standing in front of me looked nothing like the person on her social media. It was all built on lies and fake appearances. I'm different from those other models, she said proudly. I don't need surgery or fake compliments. I'm a real model. I don't suck up to people for jobs like those other girls. I'd rather stay out of that ridiculous world. Despite being disowned by our mother, Evelyn's confidence was still strong. In a strange way, I kind of admired her for it. Who would have thought that Mary would become a CEO of an apparel brand? Maybe you want me to be your model, huh? Is that it? She asked, smiling confidently. I don't usually work with family, but if you insist, I might just consider it. 
Her positive attitude was probably because our parents spoiled her so much. She was the complete opposite of me. I had always been the one looking down, unsure of myself. I wasn't sure if I envied her or not. You as our model? Well, it depends on the terms, I replied. I might even sign an exclusive contract. Oh, really? She said, perking up. But there's one thing, I continued. Our brand values a natural vibe. We showcase people as they really are, without edits. So it might be difficult for you. What? Evelyn's eyes widened in shock. I've seen your Instagram, I said. The you on there and the real you, they're completely different. Modeling without edits. Are you serious? Evelyn gasped. Her eyes opened so wide that her fake eyelashes fell off and the makeup on her face started cracking, like porcelain. I'm not going to give you money or use you as a model. You abandoned me, so please leave me alone. I said clearly, then turned my back on them. Evelyn muttered in a trembling voice, Who do you think you are? I already knew they would show up. Evelyn had posted about it on social media, claiming, I'll be the exclusive model for some company, and when I go back to my hometown, everyone keeps looking at me. Can they tell I'm a model just by my aura? Her posts were so embarrassing to read, but they were helpful for keeping track of what they were up to. Knowing my parents might visit, I was prepared and ready to handle it without getting upset. As I was leaving with my grandparents, my father, who had been silent like he wasn't even there, suddenly stepped forward with a grin. Mary, I didn't do anything bad to you. I was just a victim, scared of your strong-willed mother and Evelyn. I've always been worried about you deep down. That counts, right? His words caught me off guard, and I hesitated for a moment. Then he turned to my grandparents, apologizing seriously. Dad, Mom, thank you for taking care of Mary. She's my precious daughter, and you've protected her. But from now on, I'll be the one supporting her. My grandparents looked surprised. But before anyone could respond, my mother shouted in anger. You? You might as well have not been there at all. So just stay quiet. She was right. Her words snapped me back to reality. Aren't you also to blame for doing nothing, Dad? What? No, that's not fair. It was Evelyn and your mother who were hostile. Don't lump me in with them, he protested, trying to win me over. His attempt to act innocent was disgusting. I realized I felt nothing toward him. He was just someone whose presence or absence didn't matter. He wasn't needed in my life. Don't start acting like a father now. Mary doesn't need you, my grandpa said, voicing exactly what I was feeling. Looking embarrassed, my father tried to fade back into the background, a role he had always played well. But my mother, still hopeful, reached out to me weakly. Her older appearance made her look pitiful, a tactic she likely used to gain sympathy. Mary, I'm really sorry. It was all my fault. You've always lived without complaining, being such a good and admirable child. I thought you didn't need my help because you seemed so strong, she said softly, her words filled with regret. I realize now the truly precious daughter wasn't Evelyn, it was you, my mother said, her tearful eyes fixed on me. Evelyn might have passed the audition for the modeling agency, but instead of making money, she ended up paying them for entry fees and lessons. Could she have been tricked? My mother wondered aloud. Your father even quit his job to move to Washington to support her, but there were prettier girls everywhere. Evelyn becoming a model was never really possible. As I stayed silent, my mother kept talking. But you, Mary, you're a CEO. How wonderful. You're my daughter, and I'm so proud. The more she praised me, the colder I felt. But wasn't I the daughter you didn't need? I asked. Oh, did I say something like that? She said, pretending she didn't remember. Before she could continue, my grandpa cut in. It's rich for you to say that, considering you're the one who caused Mary to lose her leg, he said. My mother flinched. What? That was an accident. I confused the gas pedal with the brake, she said defensively. I didn't mean to. I drove into Mary while she was playing in the yard. It was a miracle she survived. That was decades ago. Why bring it up now? You've blamed me enough for that. Are you still trying to torment me? She snapped, showing no remorse. Even after all these years, she still wouldn't admit fault. It wasn't about me, was it? It was always about you. I said quietly. 
I have no memory of that time, but now I understand. This leg, it's because of you, Mom. It wasn't because I hated you, she cried. It was an accident. The guilt made me harsh toward you, Mary. That's all. That horrible accident, it's haunted me. She broke down crying, acting like the victim. But I wasn't moved. I'm the one who should be crying, I said, my voice firm. You couldn't admit your mistake. Instead of apologizing, you just made everything worse. Me, a failure? No, Mom. You're the real failure. Don't ever show your face to me again. My mother's dramatic crying stopped, and she stared at me in shock. Grandpa chuckled softly. How does it feel to be called a failure by your own daughter? He asked, smiling. My mother shook with anger and sadness, but no words came out. Grandpa turned to me, his face kind. Come on, Mary. We're going to be late for our lunch reservation. Let's go enjoy that French cuisine. My family now is only my grandparents. After that incident, Evelyn somehow became a bit of a celebrity. Her social media suddenly gained more likes and comments. It turns out someone had recorded our argument and posted it online. The clip showed Evelyn and my mother berating me, and it sparked a flood of criticism against them. Evelyn must be thrilled she finally achieved her dream of fame. It was all a misunderstanding, Mary. Please explain, she and my mother begged me. But the more they tried to argue online, the worse it got for them. Mary, you have to help us, they pleaded. There's nothing I can do. I replied with false humility. I'm just the trash you threw away, remember? No matter how hard they tried, nothing worked. Eventually, they gave up, switching from begging to screaming in frustration. I was done with them. I increased security at my company to make sure I wouldn't run into them again. At first, Evelyn, always so positive, tried to take advantage of the attention. She filled her social media with selfies, hoping to turn the critics into fans. But, as expected, it didn't work. The comment sections were full of harsh remarks, and even Evelyn's upbeat attitude couldn't handle it. After a few sad posts, Evelyn stopped updating altogether. I don't know what happened to Evelyn, or my mother after that. Oh, and my father? I almost forgot, he's just as irrelevant. This encounter with my parents made me even more grateful for my grandparents. Grandpa, grandma, thank you, I said, feeling a bit shy as I expressed my gratitude. Grandma took my hand and smiled. It's normal for grandparents to love their grandchild. Thanks to them, I've been able to live a normal life. Children should always be spoiled by their grandparents. I'm already 27, you know, I said, laughing. To us, you will always be our baby, Mary. Age and social status don't matter. You can always be yourself with us, Grandma said warmly. And with them, I knew that was true.